My name is Daniel McCaffrey and I'd like to present to you a view of the New Zealand economy and the political framework in which it sits. This is a view that you yourself can see anywhere you go, as you walk about the streets, through the cities, through the manufacturing areas in the countryside, you will see with your own eyes that this view of the economy is where we are. It's what is. So here depicted, it's a picture of the New Zealand economy and the political framework which surrounds it. And right at the heart of it, you can see there that large red square, which of course I'll explain later, is the productive economy. This is the economy that makes things, it creates things. It's the economy of agriculture, of building and construction, of transport, of distribution, of retail. This is the part of the economy you can see around you every day, which makes everything that we own or use or have access to. The productive economy. Now out on the right is part of the state apparatus which governs the state, manages the state and decides the state spending. And we'll start with the electorate. New Zealand is a little peculiar in that it allows permanent residents to vote. It's not the case in most countries. Citizens vote. No one else does. But the electorate determines who shall sit in the parliament. And in between, the offer they're made is from political parties. New Zealand doesn't go to the election and decide we'll have Joe and, and, and Winnie and we'll have all those other people, Susie and, and Josephine and whatever. We are made a proposal by political parties on how they will run the state. That's what they have access to. The state treasury, the state spending and the political parties make an offer at election time as to how they would govern the country and allocate the spending that comes into the Treasury. And after they've done all that and the electorate has spoken and the political parties have uh, gone into Parliament and the particular share that they have of the vote, Parliament decides who will be the government and it's decided on who can form a majority in the Parliament. And after that is done, there is a government with Ministers of State with control over the large blue area that spends about $80 billion of citizens' money every year, the state. Now, the state, of course, has all the arms of customs, defence. There are thousands of committees, thousands of governing boards, thousands of administrative departments, Department of Justice, uh, the department that looks after commerce, department that looks after transport, the roads, there's a lot of the state. And you can see that about you if you wander around Wellington or see what offices or laws are administered by departments in your city of town. Now, the state spends 25 billion of the 80 billion it gathers on two areas to the left. And I've split these in two. The welfare vote is 25 billion, call it for argument's sake. But I have split it into two sections. There is welfare to those who are able to work, who are physically and mentally able to take a job, any job, a job of high intellectual demand, a job of high physical demand, and a mixture of all those things in between. It's welfare to those able to work. The next step down is welfare to those unable to work. Pensioners, people who are incapacitated, people who are sick, uh, and people who, who simply cannot work who are unable to make a contribution to the economy, to the citizenry that, that they live among, and it is to them that welfare was originally paid. But they are the people who are not able to work and who receive welfare. The next step down, of course, is the finance sector. Well, the finance sector gets its money both in government investment, which is small, and the investment of citizens in the parking of their money and the use of their money and the lending it out to the productive economy or to citizens in the housing economy. And then, of course, there's the voluntary sector, which is much larger than you might imagine. This is all sorts of very worthy voluntary groups who volunteer their time and their effort uh, to make a contribution to the welfare of their fellow citizens. 
Now, down lurking underneath the state, the government, the parliament, the political parties and the electorate are the lobby groups. Now, the lobby groups are all over the place. Sometimes you'll find lobby groups in the voluntary sector. Um, all of the productive economy has uh, lobby groups in Wellington. And in some cases, they're simply there to see that their industry isn't destroyed by some absent-minded regulation the government decides to make one evening in the parliament, or to advance the interests of their industry or their people who work for them uh, and see that they're, A, not taken apart, and B, if they can get a slight advantage over their competitors. The lobby group works on government. Ministers will be lobbied endlessly by groups with a worthy cause or their, uh, their livelihoods and everything being destroyed by some proposed action of the government. The lobby groups lobby parliament incessantly. All MPs receive a voluminous amount of mail from the lobby groups, blocking this, advancing that, or expressing outrage at some other uh, proposed uh, action that the government might take, which parliament might restrain it in. And the political parties, well, they're running back and forth in the political parties as well, trying to persuade a political party that this would be good for the world and, and New Zealand, or it wouldn't be, or that this would be just the thing that would revive the economy and, and the, their industry or their voluntary group or their environmental group have all the answers. And of course, uh, the, their legion in the electorate, you'll see all those amazing ads occasionally, of some dying turtle off the Indonesia, which would persuade you that you should back the Green Party or the Labour Party about the dreadfulness of the oppression of the workers and some particular side of the economy. But the lobby groups are necessary to remind the parliamentarians, the political parties, the electorate, the government, and the officials of the state uh, that some areas just simply shouldn't be destroyed because the government has an ideological bent to do such a thing. But that's the New Zealand's political and economic framework. And it works pretty well. New Zealand's a pretty well governed country. It's a pretty peaceful country. By and large, there isn't, there's no corruption, one exception I could mention. And there's, uh, there's no hanky panky going on. Then earnestly, departments are administered as best they can. Uh, welfare is delivered to those able to work and those unable to work. And the, uh, the affairs of state are conducted with decency. And in the productive economy, it's full of enormous numbers of hardworking New Zealanders, workers, uh, employers, customers who all get together uh, and make sure that their needs are met uh, within the things that are created, produced and will be produced in the future. So there you are. That's a sum up of the framework. And now we'll talk about some of the things that are rampaging through our political thinking, which are a threat to the entirety of that arrangement. We'll also talk about some of the positive things which are coming forward, which will make life better for all New Zealanders in the framework that I have outlined to you there.